I consider my role today just that, sharing. I simply want to review with you what I've done over the last 33 years, 34 years in the treatment of patients with our RSD, CRPS. You'll, you'll hear me refer to it as RSD. I'm just an old timer. And Can you tell us what city you live in? Greenville, South Carolina. Yes. I'm boarded in physical medicine and I'm a fellow in vascular medicine. Uh, since the start of my career, I've been treating patients with sympathetic dysfunction, autonomic dysno dysautonomias. It's just always been something that I've been interested in from day one right out of the chute. So uh, I was asked to really speak on alternative uh, approaches. Um, it's a little difficult for me to even call it that way just because I've always done it this way. So um, as the society and the country is moving away from opiates and some of these other things, I've never been in an opiate office. I've always tried to treat the source, not just the symptoms. So to me, it's not an alternative. It's just the way I do things. So I'm not here to, to take away what you know or to tell you what you know is uh, good or bad or indifferent. I'm just here to share and to add my thoughts and feelings on it. Um, cannot express enough gratitude to the Stilatanos um, for having this and for Jim and RSDSA. And so without further ado, let's get started. I have 30, 30, 33 years of uh, knowledge to share in about 40, 45 minutes. <laughs> so, you know, what is our alternative approach? It's just to treat the source, not just the symptom. That's, that's really the foundation. And, you know, above all, to do no harm. Um, so there's lots of things out there that I think have value and that might work, but I kind of sometimes think the risk-benefit's not worth it, so we don't do it. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have any benefit. It's just that we don't want to do any harm in the process. Um, we want to change the focus to restoring the underlying pathology instead of just relieving the pain. And I know you don't hear that a lot, but you know, after 30 plus years of working that way, it can be done. It doesn't mean we can cure dystrophy. There's cases that do go into remission. There's cases that we've definitely reversed or taken from one stage to a lesser stage, but it's still a disease that we have to lifelong manage. And the, we do that by trying to treat the source, not just the symptom. And that means that we have to utilize a, a shared decision-making model. There's no question in my mind that, you know, we have to be on the same freight train. If we're not going in the same direction, if everyone's not working towards the same goal, if everybody doesn't understand the same treatment paradigm, the outcome's just not as good. So um, I put the horses up there because they're mavericks. Uh, you know, mavericks don't break things down. They just don't like to be corralled. They like to be able to think outside the box and do other things. And just asking everybody to open their mind to some of these concepts. So in the end, I think we all understand that nobody really knows what is the cause of RSD or CRPS. And that's really tough for medicine because in medicine, we're all trained as allopaths, as doctors, to look for a unifying diagnosis. There has to be a thing that explains everything. And if we don't have that, I don't care if it's fibromyalgia, I don't care if it's mixed headaches, it doesn't matter what the disease is. Medical doctors just don't do as well with it. So when there's no singular answer, the system breaks down. Um, but the good news is, is that with this paradigm, there doesn't have to be a single, singular answer. There's still a, a treatment protocol that can work for you. All that is required is to focus on restoring ner nerve membrane stability and blood flow. Uh, I included this particular image itself. Uh, we, we won't finish if I go into too much detail. I, I literally give this kind of talk for days on end. Um, but I, what I wanted to point out is that a nerve membrane is really an electrical field flux. So when we say somebody has nerve instability, whether it be a sciatica, a sensory dysfunction, or sympathetic dysfunction, it's because it's not holding the field flux. And the best way to think of that is the circuit breaker in your house just won't hold. Okay? So instead of just taking the microwave off or whatever it was that popped that circuit breaker, we want to try to restore the circuit breaker and then go back and fix what caused it to go bad to begin with. Does that make some sense? So you can do lots of ways of restoring, restoring nerve main, uh, membrane stability. Um, you want to do anything that affects it. It could be an anesthetic, it could be an inflammation medicine, it could give, give it oxygen, it could be n nutrition. We call it reduced total load. You'll hear that over time. The total number of things that don't allow you to get well. So it's got to require much more of a holistic concept. Um, you want to avoid toxins, things that make your nerves bad, and you want to just have some mindfulness. Um, I say that because one guy uh, comes to mind as I speak. Uh, as a young gentleman. His mother's with him, and he had pretty bad dystrophy of his foot, and um, she's trying to help her son. And um, he was so mad that he had his dystrophy that he would go out and kick the cows with his, his foot. That's how he took out his anger. Kind of tough to have some mindfulness and help that when that's 
what you're dealing with all the time. So we, of course we want to treat the whole person and try to change their relationship to it. But again, everyone's got to work in the same direction and have some mindfulness about what's going on. Address infection, inflammation, and of course lack of blood flow. And anything that restores stability can reduce pain. That's what it's all about. We don't assume that all cases are alike. Um, there are different mechanisms of injury. There are different clinical presentations. Um, you can have a, a case where basically the skin looks just fine. You can have cases where there's loss of bone and muscle. You can have vasomotor changes. You can get pseudomotor changes. You can have a swelling. Not all cases are alike. And there's different pre-existing conditions. Somebody might have diabetes. Another person might have lupus. Uh, another person may have a clotting disorder. That changes your ability to get blood flow into the tissues that are relatively ischemic because of the sympathetic dysfunction. You have to treat the whole person. And there's different courses of care. Different people have had complications. They've had hardware put in. They've had infections. So why would we treat all cases the same? One of the big concepts that we use is we look for generators. The generator is not often always what was actually injured. So somebody would say, oh, I know the generator. I broke my foot. Well, but the bone is healed. The bone's not actually what's generating it. It could be the soft tissue around it. It could be that the ligaments are torn. Ligaments are richly innervated by sympathetic nerve fibers. And they're major generators of sympathetic pain. So when we say block above and treat below, what we mean is you have to quiet the sympathetic response down, and then you have to restore that injury. You have to do whatever it takes in order to make that heal so that the sympathetic response hopefully will dampen on its own over time. And I just show this picture here of a couple of generators. Again, uh, I don't have uh, a full day to go through all of these, but this is a, a, the dura, the coverings of the spinal cord. They're richly innervated by the sympathetic system, and they present in like a shaw or cape distribution. Um, this is l uh, muscle. A lot of times when somebody presses on muscle, they say, oh, I feel that all the way down my leg. Well, muscle doesn't do that. A motor nerve doesn't do that. A sensory nerve doesn't do that. The sympathetic nerve does that. By the way, we call it the sympathetic nerve. We could have called it a crowbar, right? It's just the name. It doesn't mean you get sympathy. It doesn't mean we think it's in your head. It's just the name of the nerve. So don't let that uh, affect you or confuse you. And a nice thing that you can always utilize, and I tell this to physicians all the time, is that whenever ligaments are generators, for example, these are ligaments that are in the interspinous ligaments that hold the bones of the spine together. Maybe there was a whiplash, a torn ligament. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. As you'll notice, even though it affects the whole limb, it always skips a joint. So with a regular nerve, a sensory or motor nerve, it's like boom, a sharp electric bolt goes from my neck into my thumb. With sympathetic pain, it's not like that. Yeah, my thumb is numb. Well, how come when I stick it with a pin or touch you, it hurts so much? I don't know. I'm not crazy. My thumb is numb. Okay, we call that nulliness. Most physicians don't really know that word. It was termed by a gentleman, a physician named Tommy Dorman. So that's when you feel numb, but it's not. And that's generated by ligament that's sympathetically derived. And that word we use is called a scleratome. So if you're talking to your physician, you might just say, you know, could this be sclerotomally induced? And if they look at you, you might say, you remember, myotomes supply muscles, dermatomes supply skin and sensation, sclerotomes come from soft tissue generation. And if they still look at you, just say, you know, do you know somebody who understands this? Okay? Or at least give them this slide. It's up, a lot of this is on our, web slide, our website. Ask them to start thinking a little bit more about what could actually be generating this. Another thing that we do, I think, that is different is we actually objectify the presence of the disease. We try to map its distribution. We try to show that um, where it's coming from. We use that map, if you will. This is a vasomotor map, a skin temperature map, and we use it with what we call sympathetic skin response studies, which is thermal imaging, infrared thermal imaging under cold stress. You don't expect to take a hot glass of water, put it in the refrigerator, and come back to, get to it in an hour and expect one half to be hot and one half to be cold. You expect it to equilibrate. And we expect you to equilibrate as well. And if it doesn't, usually, not always, but 95 plus percent of the time for sympathetic dysfunction, the cold side is the symptomatic side. And the distribution with which it is abnormal or that it's not in gives me clues as to what's generating that sympathetic response. So I now can start looking for the generator, and I now know how high up I have to go in order to dampen the generator. There's no point in me trying to do a block or a treatment when I'm below how high up the sympathetic response is. There's still people out there that believe dystrophy only occurs in a limb, in the hand. 
Well, of course, it exists in your legs. It, occur, we, it exists in your face. It can occur in your trunk. It can occur in your torso. It can occur in your breast. And until you start um, objectifying this and visualizing it and showing it's present, it, it, you're not even really able to study um, wh what it is you're dealing with. So cold stress thermography is really the only test that can map these changes. So in a case of classic RSD, you'll see the entire limb is cold. Now, I've cut this down. There's usually 36 images. This is just for teaching purposes today. But it, don't let this uh, confuse you. This is nothing more than a temperature palette. Each color is 1 degree centigrade. You're supposed to be the same from side to side. If it's, more than one, if it's equal to or more than 1 degree centigrade change from side to side, you're not equilibrating normally. Your sympathetic system is either sluggish, it's abnormal, <coughs> or it's just hyperactive, or it's not working. Again, beyond the scope of everything I can talk to you about with regard to that today. But in classic dystrophy, it doesn't matter what view I look at, they're always different, the entire limb. And that's what we would call classic case of RSD. So in this particular case, uh, it started with a broken ankle. Clearly, treating this person's ankle is not going to work. You have to go much higher up to even start influencing what's going on. Dystrophy might also affect just a portion of the limb. So in this case, we see it only below the knee. This is the front and back views of the leg. We've always put arrows on this to help you find them. So the more distal the findings are, the less effective proximal treatment is. So for, we'll show you other examples. But if I only have a change in my finger and I'm starting to trying to treat that through my neck, it's just not going to work as good. Okay? I have to get closer to that source it's in order to um, block above and treat below. This is a sclerotomally induced case of dystrophy like we just described in the C6 distribution. So that means that we're at the C6 vertebra between C5, 6 and the neck. The ligament that holds bone to bone is like stretch tape. It's like a pin in the door hinge where the pin is weak and the hinge is sliding on itself. It's the sympathetic nerve supplying it and it's abnormally reacting. It's dieseling. It's firing like a car that um, won't stop even though you've got the key in your hand. And it's producing a pain pattern that we call a C6 distribution. Instead of infecting the entire limb, it goes down, for example, into the first and second finger of the hand. It's on the dorsal and radial aspect of the forearm. Okay? So that means I need to be treating structures that are supplied by C6, myotomes, dermatomes, or sclerotomes. I have to go all the way up into the neck, and I need to treat at C6 or above C6 in order to influence this structure. Spinal induced sympathetic pain exists as well. We see quite a bit of it, failed necks, failed backs, whether it be fusion or not. There's something called the recurrent nerve of Lushka. Instead of it affecting the entire limb all the way down, it's just a branch of the nerve that comes back and supplies itself on the back side. We call those facet joints, for example. And they show up on thermal imaging as a hot spot here. So for musculoskeletal SSR, sympathetic skin response studies, we have certain thermal signatures. And I'm showing you today these signatures. These are patterns that are known, that are described, that are in the uh, American Academy of Thermology guidelines that help you know exactly what it is you're looking at. They're not maybe your guesses, thermal images. And then there are variants that exist. Um, we get people that come to us from all over the country, um, internationally, quite frankly. And one of the reasons is for this particular problem called the posterior cervical sympathetic syndrome of beret liu Beret is a Frenchman. Liu is a Chinese man. Man, it was described in the 40s. It was published in the Lancet Journal of Medicine, a highly respected uh, uh, medical journal, after a whiplash injury. Somebody that could have fallen. It doesn't have to be from a car accident, but anything that causes the neck to go back and forward. In this case, it's not just, oh, I was in a car accident and my neck hurts, but you were in a car accident, for example, and my neck hurts and I have ringing in my ears and I have blurred vision and I get nausea and I have trouble swallowing. You don't have to be a doctor to know that this case is going to be tougher than one that just says, my neck hurts. Okay? And that's because it's a pull injury or a traction injury on the sympathetic chain in the back side of the neck. There is no other way. There is no other way but thermal imaging to objectify the presence of this disorder. And it shows up in the face and the head and neck. So you don't expect, for example, in this case, the mandible is cold on the left compared to the right. And why are the strap muscles in the neck here also cold on the left compared to the right? Okay, so um, vasomotor headaches, migraine, cluster headaches are all dysautonomias. They're all signs or symptoms of sympathetic dysfunction. RSD is not the only kind of sympathetic dysfunction. 
one of the problems, one of the reasons this is so hard to treat is number one, people don't actually study it. They don't objectify what they're treating. And the third thing is autonomic dysfunction is hard. And there's lots of things that do this, not just dystrophy. So you actually have to have an interest in autonomic dysfunction besides just dystrophy in order to even start really putting time and effort into understanding all the iterations of this. Here's another iteration. It's called the angry backfiring C syndrome. In this case, some people may have heard of uh, hot points or trigger points, okay? But some trigger points are actually derived. Trigger points are when you press on a muscle and it hurts more than it should. But it only hurts in a certain spot, and that spot is what we call the neuromuscular junction, where a nerve inserts into the muscle to supply it. In this case, we always see that there's a localized hot spot right over that neuromuscular junction. They have warm hyperalgesia, so that means that warm actually makes them worse, not cold. Cold actually reduces the pain. This person I might actually send to therapy, for example, and actually ask them to put ice on it. Happens in about the less than 5% of sympathetic pain. By the way, some people have mixed presentations as well. They're allodynic. You touch them, they still hurt. They hurt excessively. It's due to an axon reflex. It's literally where that car engine is backfiring, only this time the car engine is the nerve ending itself. And the important part of this is that it's due to a calcium-dependent cal uh, pot potassium channel. So most of you are going to, okay, this is medical, I don't know what a calcium channel blocker is, but you do, because a lot of you have heard about catapress, or a lot of you have heard about blood pressure medicines that work on the calcium channel blocker cascades. This is a very nice medication to give either a beta blocker, like Inderol 2, or something that will reduce blood flow as opposed to increase blood flow. So the pharmacology of this case is going to be determined on its presentation. In this case, we have a triple C syndrome. It simply stands for the three C's. We have cold hyperesthesia. What that means is, is that I touch you with cold and you don't know that it's cold, okay? But you have hyperalgesia. I touch you with cold and you don't say it's cold, you say it's pain, it hurts. It's not a normal presentation for how we do that. And your skin is measurably and, and palpably cold. By the way, uh, besides thermal imaging being the only thing that can map these changes, it is way more sensitive than just touching with your hand. If you're going to touch with your hand, use the back of your hand. It's maybe 10% as sensitive as thermal imaging will be. You're just going to miss a lot. And this is due to a different kind of potassium gate in the background uh, of that nerve membrane that we're trying to restore its nerve membrane stability. So the findings, by objectifying it, knowing the iteration, and actually studying what you're doing should change what it is you're going to do for treatment. That's the reason you run a test, because it's going to change what you do. You want to validate it. And by the way, for each and every one of you, validating the disease is important. It's real important. But not only am I validating it, I'm looking at what's generating it, how high up is it, does it go, is there spread, is there not spread, is there something else, and I'm choosing a treatment plan based on those findings, including the pharmacology that I may choose to provide. I've already mentioned this, but keep in mind that all sympathetic dysfunction is not RSD. There's postural orth orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. These are people that get up and down. They, can control, they cannot control their heart rate. We don't, we don't tell our pupils to dilate when it's dark out. We don't tell our heart to beat. We don't tell our lungs to breathe. We don't tell our bladder to empty. We don't tell our bowels to empty. These are done automatically or, or autonomically. And when there's something wrong with them, maybe you don't have uh, Parkinson's disease where you can't get out of the bed and you have Shy Drager, which is an extreme case of this. Maybe you just have a little bit of this. We call that a dysautonomia. It's your autonomic nervous system that's getting affected. You already know that. If you have dystrophy, you already know that it's affecting things besides just the body part involved. You have to treat the autonomic nervous system, quiet down all of that. The fight or flight response is part of that. Anything that, that contributes or adds fuel to that fire, you want to dampen it, you want to try to understand it. You want to, it's the reason the weather bothers you, because your fingers swell when it's hot, and they constrict when it's cold. And if you're dysautonomic, it doesn't work right. So your body's telling you that. That's why you're sensitive to the weather. So all, not all asymmetries are RSD is the point. So what do we do? How do we actually identify these generators? 
what, is, what would be our course of care? I don't always start, by the way, with thermal imaging. Depending on what's wrong with you, I may very well just start with my history, physical, some lab, and we'll go over that. I might just get x-rays. I might do an EMG. We'll go over these things. Unless you're a rip-roaring clear case of dystrophy, I'm going to first go after low-hanging fruit. I would much rather find something else I can treat in that when I get rid of it, you go, oh my god, I'm three quarters better. You know, thank god. I didn't even have to deal with the dystrophy, okay? Because I quieted down the dieseling. I quieted down the input into that circuit breaker that's trying to pop. I made it so that the dam couldn't overflow. Now, I've got a much better chance of trying to fix the whole system, don't I? Okay, so I have seen cases of people presenting with dystrophy that just had bad osteoarthritis. No one bothered to took an x-ray. They wrote them off as dystrophy. They could have spurs. They could have joint subluxations. These are all just things that can generate that abnormal sympathetic response because the sympathetic system supplies or innervates all tissues of what we call mesodermal or ectodermal origin. It's muscle, tendon, dura, fascia, skin, disc. It's everything, okay? So if any reason, it won't let go. It won't stop innervating. It won't stop firing. Maybe you tore a ligament and there was a hidden infection that had been there for decades and now the nerve's infected. It's not going to stop. We need to find where that's coming from, fix the nerve, fix the source, fix the infection. So these are different things that could be causing or generating that sympathetic response. Advanced imaging, you, there could be a disc, there can be torn ligament, there can be um, fused spine. Electrodiagnostics, it absolutely is worth treating peripheral neuropathy. We, have, we do use a form of laser, by the way. Our, company, our office is a, uh, has a portion of it, a room of it, that's actually a franchise with the University of Minnesota Medical School affiliate company called Relief. And we literally use their software and we literally apply their program to reverse peripheral neuropathy. I have a number of dystrophy patients where their neuropathy is bothering them more than the dystrophy. Okay? And you have to be able to split that out. You have to be able to know what it is that you're trying to deal with. Treat the nerve root in your back. Why wouldn't I treat the nerve root in your back and get rid of that part that's going down into your leg? You don't need that if you have dystrophy in your leg. Treat low-hanging fruit. For us, you come in and say back pain and we go, that's it, hallelujah. Okay? Other doctors don't like that. But compared to dystrophy, if it's just the back, it's a lot easier to treat. That's really the point. We've been using musculoskeletal ultrasound in our office for decades now because we like to use it to image up where those torn ligaments, tendons, and muscles are because we think that they are generators of sympathetic dysfunction. We go after those sclerotomal maps and we, um, we'll talk about treatments that we use to actually restore them. We look for lupus, rheumatoid. We don't care if you don't have them. You can go to another doctor and you'll say, oh, you don't have lupus. And you say, well, I have an, a an ANA is elevated or I carry rheumatoid factor. Oh, no, you don't have the disease. By the way, they're right. You don't have the disease, but you may carry the trait, which means that your body is tending to be inflamed and we're reducing total load. So other things that other people ignore, you're not bad enough to need IV, um, DMARDs, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. You're not bad enough to need all of these you know, newfangled high genetic medications for rheumatic disease, but you're still inflamed. Your sympathetic nerve doesn't need that. Your body doesn't need that. We need to try to reduce everything that doesn't allow you to get well, because frankly, you don't have the reserve energy to be putting into these other things. It needs to be putting it into getting well so we can reverse your dystrophy, and we need to help all those other things so you're not wasting your energy on those other things. We look for vascular changes. It was because of thermal imaging that I became a fellow in vascular medicine. You know, I'm failing. I'm not helping people. Sympathetic pain is tough. I, like, you know, I just, I'm literally sitting in bed and night going like, you know, my God, what can I do? And I had this incredible epiphany. You know what? If sympathetic pain is these tiny little blood vessels that they're just not, they're constricted and you can't get any blood flow in them, maybe I could like prime the pump and see what's going on in the big blood vessels. I don't know why this is such an epiphany and why people haven't just grabbed this. And the longer I'm doing this, the more I think that the best way to treat sympathetic pain is by treating vascular disease. If you're a diabetic, if you have hardening of the arteries, if you have narrowing of the arteries, why would you be getting more blood flow into those tiny little arteries? We started checking other tests that look for that, increasing blood flow, putting, working on nutrition, things that improve oxygenation. Anything that improves blood flow is going to help you. Okay? We've had incredible improvement just from that. We do believe that there's an axis between your hormonal system, the adrenal system, the neuro neurological, neuroinflammatory, and immune system. It's a tough one. It's really tough. 
I, I tell you, I spent my whole career trying to define it and trying to say, if this happens, do this. It's just not going to happen. Certainly not for me. It's just too hard. But there's times when it's obvious, and you can start working on that axis. We do do some hormone pellet implants only for testosterone because it's regenerative. Everything we do is regenerative. And if I can improve bone strength and stop pseudox atrophy, if that's what you need, and some of the other signs and symptoms that go along with that pellet, we're going to do it. We don't do hormones across the board. We used to. I haven't found them to be otherwise largely ineffective. You'll see that we treat the immune system uh, in a hidden infection. I'll spend a little bit more time on that. We do think if you have heavy metals, it's worth looking at, getting rid of it. We want you to have a good nutrition, nutritional base. Nobody gets better if they don't have a good nutritional base in metabolic medicine. Basically, treat the whole person. Control your other diseases so that you have an opportunity to improve. We started out with something called vascular Doppler and then went, moved on to duplex. Vascular Doppler is nothing more than a blood pressure test. It's a blood pressure cuff on your arm, only we're going to do it in segments, and we're going to do it in your legs, and we're going to look to see if your pressure drops. It's kind of like somebody flushes the john in your house and your sink pressure goes out. It's not supposed to happen. So we're looking for signs of what we can do to improve oxygen in there. If we find that, we'll usually go ahead and uh, progress to duplex. This is an ultrasound arterial duplex. We're just looking for narrowing of the arteries. Maybe I'm going to put you on Platol, Plavix. I'm going to put you on medications that increase blood flow depending upon the findings. I want to treat comorbid, coexisting people that also have peripheral arterial disease and venous disorders. I see a good number of dystrophy patients where their feet are blue, their legs are blue. It's usually not dystrophy when that's going on. It's usually venous reflux. Okay? Treat the reflux. It can make a big difference. Gait and posture analysis. But doc, when I walk, get, my back gets worse. Well, maybe you have polio and it does. Maybe you have arthritic knee and it does. Maybe there is truly a mechanical component to what's going on. And if I can improve the mechanics of your gait and your posture and your physiology, I'm going to want to do that. All right, let's go on to some of the treatment options. I'm, we're not going to cover everything on earth that can be done, but I'm specifically trying to talk about how we do things and why we do things and try to stay within my assigned topic. We don't usually start with sympathetic blocks. We usually start with steroid. I am not a big steroid user. In fact, I don't use a lot of it at all. But I do think epidurals in the case of sympathetic pain works. It's because the cortisone, the steroid, the dexamethasone, whatever it is that you're using, affects that neuroimmune autonomic system. It quiets inflammation down. And it quiets down the sympathetic system. But beyond that, the details of it, I don't think any of us actually know. But remember, I'm trying to stop the dieseling. I'm trying to stop that sympathetic response so that you'll let me treat below, so that you're okay for me to treat below. Because if I stop mucking around with that area that was the generator and don't do anything above it to quiet it down, you're not going to like me, okay? It's going to hurt too much. So I would rather block above and treat below. You're going to hear me say that over and over. And the sympathetic system does respond to cortisone. Not by, I don't like giving it by your whole body. I like using it targeted to know where, I need, to where it needs to go. We do a whole host of nerve blocks. Um, we do, and I mean a lot of different kinds of nerve blocks. Uh, it really, I've been pretty much told by my peers that, you know, I'll put a needle anywhere, which in a lot of ways is somewhat true, but they're always selective towards what I think is above the generator so that I can go below and treat the source. That could be in the spine, it can be in the periphery, it can be in tendon, it can be in muscle. The goals include pain reduction, tissue restoration, and we're trying to restore that nerve membrane stability. So, you know, in the United States, we say, we call it a nerve block. We put an anesthetic on there so we block you from feeling the pain. But in Europe, they call it nerve restoration. So remember I told you that that nerve membrane was unstable? Well, the reason it's unstable is because it's supposed to rest at what we call minus 70 millivolts. And in the case of an unstable or irritable nerve, it's resting at, say, minus 30, where it's supposed to be firing at. When you put the medication on there, it drops it down to, like, minus 100. It says you're not doing, you're not going to fire. Okay, if your nerve is healthy enough that it just needed help to get back to where it needed to be, that block could last forever. Just like I reset the circuit breaker in my house, it never popped again. If that nerve isn't healthy enough to be where, uh, where it can maintain it, then it's going to pop again. Okay, so I want to lengthen the time, over time, that that circuit breaker isn't popped. I want to help you get well. I want to help the nerve get well. I want to get rid of the iteration, the generator of what's making it pop. 
while I'm constantly trying to restore it. I'm not trying to block it. I'm trying to repair it. And that philosophy and the approach is just simply different than what's typically done when my goal is block and I'm done. Block and punt, block and punt. We don't do that. We don't use a lot of fluoro. Um, I've been in solo private practice uh, for 34 years. I'm delighted to say that last year I brought in a partner. Um, he does do some fluoro, but he really only does it about a half a day a week. Um, since he's been in our office, he's just done less and less of it. Um, he was somebody that did fluoro full time before coming to me. We use ultrasound guidance for almost everything. The cost of the injection of the block is several thousand dollars less. There's no radiation. You don't have to go into sedation. You don't have to go to the uh, surgery center. You can just get it done in the office. It just makes it much simpler. Again, trying to show different things. Um, I started this back in the 90s. This particular paper was published in 1998. It's instead of giving a stellate block with a needle, which we do them by needle, but truthfully, most of the times for the stellate in the neck, we're going to use what's called an electric stellate block, where instead of mechanically sticking your neck with a needle and creating a pore, we're going to use an electrical poration and cause the nerve membrane to electrically hyperpolarize. Okay? The nice thing about that is they don't have to stick your neck every day. The anatomy is not distorted. I'm not injuring you by doing that every day. We've got lots of papers on what we've done and published and on, on utilizing this particular technique. I, wanted, I included this slide not to show you about the stellate ganglion block, but to show you about the cervical plexus block. The cervical plexus block is, is lateral. It's on the side of the neck. It's a combination of nerves that comes out from the top of the spinal cord and goes down into all the muscles that supply here. It's not the cervical plexus that I care so much about. It's that the cervical plexus is richly supplied by the sympathetic system. So I can do a cervical plexus block and get everything all the way down. Okay, now it depends on what's going on and when I say everything. I'm always going to be blocking towards what generates or supplies that area that we measured on the SSR study. It's just another option to try to show you. We do a lot of proliferative injections. We've blocked above. If ligament is involved, we're going to try to restore it. Prolotherapy means to proliferate or to regrow. So in the case of prolotherapy, we're going to give you an injection. We're going to do it one time, once every couple, three weeks, of some natural compounds that pull your growth factors to the area. So what I want you to think of is a scab healing skin. That's all I'm doing. I'm just helping your body jumpstart its natural wound healing response when we do proliferative injections. And we've shown that there's been biopsies done that it actually shows a 40% thickening of the ligament after three injections. We get this covered. We do everything in a very documented way. We have to do it in a very specific way. But as long as we do things, we're able to file this and get it covered. We also do a procedure called percutaneous tenotomy. Sometimes it's a fasciotomy. I'll show you some pictures of this later as well. But in this case, um, we're actually taking a tendon. In this case, that's an um, ECRL tendon. This is a tendon on like a, a, a golfer's elbow. I'm sorry, a tennis elbow. And we're going to numb you up. I'm going to stab that tendon like a horse's tail. I'm going to feather it 100 times at least and create a massive wound healing response to get that ligament to regrow into the bone. You're numb. It doesn't hurt at all. Most people take a Tylenol or nothing over the next couple of days. 80% success rate. It doesn't work if your tendon's torn, gone, nothing there, nada. But most tendons aren't like that. 90% of them are grade 1 through 3. And of course, the lower the grade, the more effective it is. But we have other things for the more severe that we could use. We do that under ultrasound guidance as well. We do an immuno immunoinflammatory approach. We can use some of that laboratory to look for things like mycoplasma. Mycoplasma are a different kind of infection. So I want you to think of the sinus infection that you never really got rid of. It took you months till you stopped coughing. You never took your full dose of antibiotic. Think of a worm that you cut and the pieces are now still moving. Mycoplasma are the remnants of strep, the remnants of another infection. They don't like uh, um, oxygen, so they hide in places like ligaments and things that don't have a lot of blood flow. And they don't care how long they're there. They can stay there decades, literally. They're just happy as a camper. They're just happy as a lark. 
until an injury happens, until something happens where it gets exposed, until maybe the nerve tissue surrounding the area gets infected. So we look for that because it's an easy way to treat it. We give them an ARB, it's a blood pressure medicine that kind of tells the body, hey, that's a mycoplasma. It turns out that the mycoplasma are attracted by the ARB and it binds and now all, the body, all of a sudden the body can find it. And then we put them on an antibiotic called minicin. So minicin is not like a regular antibiotic where you take it for a week. We might, you might take this for at least six months, maybe two or three years because these infections are really hard to get rid of. I don't even check your lab again for at least six months. There's no point, okay? The point is, I don't expect you to take this medicine and feel better overnight, but I'm trying to help your body heal, I'm trying to help your body get rid of anything that might be causing the sympathetic system, sympathetic nerves not to work properly. I might give you compression stockings if you have venous reflux. We use a product called Juice Plus. Um, there's 15 medical school studies on it. It's literally whole raw fruits and vegetables that have been juiced and air dried. University of Maryland Medical School did a double blind study on that blood pressure test that we showed you. They showed a 47% increase in blood flow in the limbs if you will just take Juice Plus or eat five different raw fruits and vegetables a day. It's inexpensive. It's another way of increasing oxygen. Magnesium citrate, you can buy that over the counter. Um, Omega-3s, anything that I know that helps support nerve membrane stability, I'm going to help you try and do that. Beluke is another over-the-counter. It's an earthworm enzyme extract that literally breaks up clots. It literally breaks up um, little, what we call thrombin clots that might be causing reflux. It cleans out your veins so we can get rid of the reflux. We've put people on Lovenox. We put them, uh, which is a, like a heparin type injection, if you will, that you can take at home, trying to improve blood flow, trying to improve your vessels. I've reversed cases, I mean, I've literally reversed cases and dramatically improved outcomes by treating patients this way. Catapress is a blood pressure medicine. We touched on that before to increase blood flow. I put people on Plavix for hardening of the arteries and been able to get some improvement in their sympathetic pain. So let, let's kind of put all this together. How does this actually present? How does this uh, pan out when we're um, really looking uh, at a case? So um, here's a, a patient that presented with um, Borreliu. So you see that they have an uh, asymmetry pattern, the anterior aspect of the face, um, also a little bit over the omohyoid, but pretty clearly over the maxillary region. <coughs> Usually Borreliu is associated with something going on in the back of the neck, so we check them on ultrasound. And we see this C23 interspinous strain. See this, ultra, this is an old image, shows you how long I've been doing it. Of course, we just bought brand new ultrasound machines, probably the fourth iteration since I did this study. But these black holes aren't supposed to be there. It's sonar, that's all it is, it's an echo. For those of you that are old enough to remember TV screens with gray dots on them, it's supposed to be full of snow. And when it's not, because there's something not there. So in this case, we did a sphenopalatine ganglion block, which is a sympathetic nerve blockade that we approach um, through the pterygoid fossa uh, above the maxillary arch, okay, because I have to get above that, because that's where the sympathetic response is. And then I went ahead and I did a proliferative injection at C23 in the neck in order to stop what was generating it. So I used this treatment approach to help me figure out what I'm going to do for this patient based on my findings. Um, here's another example of block above and treat below. This is a, a woman that came to me that um, had uh, a tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis, um, exactly like we've talked about. You can see that there's a clear asymmetry pattern in the lateral aspect of the arm. She's got some radiation into the um, uh, front of the forearm and the dorsal forearm. You can even see it in the radial aspect of the forearm. I actually knew this patient from a, a previous a problem for a back and a leg problem. She was very happy with me. Two, three years later, she came back and told me that she had gone to an orthopedist for her elbow. It's kind of like, us doctors are like, I thought I really helped you. Why didn't you come here to begin with? So I didn't know you did arms. I thought you only did legs. I was like, okay. So she goes, but then I went to the doctor and he wanted to operate on my elbow. I wasn't going to let that happen. So then I decided I was going to see what you, if you can help me. All right. Well, truthfully, I missed it. I had no idea. We're talking about options. I'm looking at her elbow on the ultrasound. And she says to me that she gets like uh, some vasospasm. spasm. She gets basically what might be called the Raynaud's of her second and third fingers. Well, I've never seen it in her. She never complained about it. So we decided to check her on thermal imaging. Sure enough, she had a sympathetic response going up in the whole arm. So we went ahead and did a stellate block. And then I did an ultrasound guided percutaneous tenotomy. She was very happy, never had any problem with it since. 
Sometimes blocking above can actually treat the source. So this is a person that um, had a left shoulder adhesive capsulitis, which means that they can't move their shoulder at all. Um, this particular person um, had been um, in Florida, one of the centers down there, and was told that they had spread of their dystrophy. It started out that they had dystrophy in their leg, and now she presents with adhesive capsulitis. She was told that she needed to be on IV ketamine, that she had spread of her dystrophy, and that um, that was the treatment option. So she came and saw me. We did the sympathetic uh, skin response study, and we were able to see that the changes here tracked in what we would call the C6, uh, C5-6 distribution. Um, these are images are just an older camera. That's why the resolution is just a little bit different. But I went ahead and did a paravertebral nerve block. I went ahead and injected the neck up here um, under ultrasound guidance with some numbing medicine. Boom, shoulder started moving right away. Never needed the surgery. Block above and treat comorbid conditions. So you have to remember that you're treating a whole person. You're not treating a test. You're not treating just one body part. So this person had a Morton's neuroma resection, which is a little nerve that uh, gets stuck between the toes. We call it a Morton's neuroma. And so they had it removed because they had persistent pain in their foot. But they had a past medical history for diabetes, hypertension, and venous reflux. So we went ahead and looked and see, uh, checked her on sympathetic skin response. This tracks in what we would call an L4-5 distribution. So I did a lumbar sympathetic block in this case at L4-5. And then we went ahead and got her sugar under control treated her reflux, and gave her a vascular medicine approach, um, problem was solved. Um, as we progressed, um, we're always looking for something new. We're always looking for what else can we do, because we're always not succeeding with everybody. We do feel that if over time, we tell everybody there will be no touchdown pass. There's not going to be a touchdown pass. Our goal is that a year from now, your quality of life is better than it is today. And most often we can do that because we're doing things that other people simply haven't done. All we're doing is helping you get well. And since those other things haven't been done, we're pretty confident about that and our numbers are pretty good. So as uh, this probably at least 10 years minimum, uh, maybe 15 years now, this is platelet-rich plasma. Um, we uh, started working with that. And I'll tell you, this is a reasonable expectation about why this case comes to mind. So this is a 15-year-old gentleman that came from, uh, was diagnosed with RSD at Children's Clinic in Cincinnati. Um, so we did a diagnostic ultrasound and we found that both, uh, both tendons in the elbow were bad, the extensor carpi radialis and the flexor carpi ulnaris. But the person traveled, they couldn't come back every two to three weeks. Um, finances were an issue. So we went to something called platelet-rich plasma. So I told you with prolotherapy to proliferate, we use gentle compounds and we pull your growth factors to the area like a scab healing skin. With platelet-rich plasma, we take 60 cc's, a fistful of blood, out of your arm. We spin it down to 6 cc's. We concentrate the growth factors and we put them where we want it to go. It's just a much more robust wound healing cascade. As we start to get into some of these other regenerative techniques, PRP is one of them, they're not covered by insurance. It's not one of the things we go to first unless we have issues or reasons why we do go to it first, or we have that shared decision-making model where you say, I want to do this. It doesn't matter to me whether it's covered or not. I have these reasons why we need to do it. And as long as we're on the same freight train, we'll go ahead if we think it makes sense. But because of travel, we went ahead and did um, a, uh, a PRP injection. The person did great. Okay, so you start asking yourself, why? What, what worked? Okay, was it because I did the block, block above and treat below? Was it because there's something about growth factors that allowed the body to actually heal? Did it actually stop the dieseling? Because sometimes, quite frankly, I'll treat below and it doesn't work. I still have to do the block. The nerve is still dieseling. There's still something else going on. There's times, believe it or not, a lot of times, you treat the source, the dieseling shuts off. Now, we might call that RSD in remission. We actually never say you're cured of RSD because I've seen cases where they come back 10 years later and it's reoccurred or they have a new problem, okay? So we never say that we cure dystrophy. We just say that we can try to improve your quality of life, improve your function. But we have definitely had cases go into remission. So we started thinking more and more about this entire regenerative medicine product line. I mean, that's what we do anyways. Everything we're doing is restoring. It's what my whole career has been about. So um, this case we uh, published, and so we like to show it because it's been popularized, and anyone that uh, would like to share more about their experiences uh, is, is free to. Um, but 
in this case, we had somebody that had a RSD of their left leg after a trimalleolar ulnar fracture. We did a segmental vascular study on them. They actually had vascular disease. They have hardening of the arteries. It's not severe, but it is there. ABI is not supposed to be greater than 1.2. It, we usually use a cut of a little bit lower, but 1.3 is clearly abnormal on the left. They had a drop of 30 millimeters of pressure. You're not supposed to have high pressure here and then low pressure there. So there's, some, the va there's actual vascular disease going on in that left leg. And in this case, we chose to do a bone marrow aspirate. Um, so bone marrow aspirate where we actually took blood out of the pelvis, spun it down, shifted it out, um, culture, not cultured it, but per, uh, were able to um, isolate those cells to the stem cells and then re-injected them in the leg. And we injected them above, so we injected them in this case in the calf and then in the ankle. And this is what they looked like before treatment and this is what they looked like after treatment. We don't say we cure dystrophy. We do say that we can reverse disease, we can improve your outcome and improve your function. So in, I'm not going to tell you everything's 100%. I'm never going to make any guarantees. You come to my office, in fact, we tell you there are no guarantees. Okay? The only thing we can guarantee is to do the very best that we can. So rather than doing bone marrow aspirate, um, more and more now we use umbilical cord derived stem cells so that we don't have to actually do a surgical procedure on you. So you can actually purchase uh, from FDA approved facilities and companies now stem cells that are quantifiable in terms of the number of cells that you get. They're umbilical cord derived, they're not from a fetus, they're not from the placenta, and there's no ethical or religious concerns whatsoever. So in this case, we have a 32-year-old woman that presented with a left ankle fracture treated by operative repair internal fixation with a pin, and that was removed after um, an inversion injury. So she had twisted her ankle, she had a broken ankle, it required a plate and a pin. They took the pin out, but they left the plate in place. They took the pin out because she was just hurting too much. Under ultrasound, we found the fibulotalo and medial deltoid ligament strains. So fibulotalo would be on the outside of your ankle, and the medial deltoid would be on the inside of the ankle. The ligaments that hold the bone to bone were still strained. The, the bone had healed. Um, I treated her with a sympathetic block, epidurals. We did local prolotherapy. None of them helped. Just, we're just not getting anywhere. So we went ahead and tried the stem cell. We did 30 million umbil umbilical stem cells grafted into the length ankle ligaments and into the calf and all the way up at L4-5 because we saw this on the lumbar study. PRP was followed two weeks later. In our case, we don't do PRP right out of the chute. It's an additional cost. We wait. Two weeks later, if you're not better, then we do it. We try to save you the money. I'd say half the cases, we end up not needing it. Over the next six months, she had 85% symptom reduction, and she's off all meds now. She still comes to see me. She still has weather sensitive pain, but she's living. She's functional. She's way better than she used to be. So this is our paradigm. Uh, we reduce total load. We just think about restoration. Um, we don't want to contribute to the disease and anything that we use for treatment. We want to manage your expectations. We don't want you thinking that, you know, we walk on water and that we can do something that we can't. Um, we want you to understand that in many ways this is like a boat that's full of water and, you know, we're going to bail it out, we're going to bail it out, and so maybe we're going to have to do a lot of aggressive care at the beginning, and over time that should be less and less, but the boat still has a leak. We never actually cured the disease. We want you to understand dysautonomia. We want you to understand that this is not just a painful limb, all the things that affect the autonomic nervous system, so your own fight or flight doesn't uh, contribute to it, so that when you're having a bad day, you can see that two days out there's a front coming on, and you can calm yourself down, that in two days it'll be gone or better. And a big thing that we do, quite frankly, is we help you find meaning in adversity. So a lot of people don't do this, but not everybody needs this. But when you need this, it's probably the most important thing. And with a lot of people with chronic pain, especially with sympathetic uh, autonomic derived pain syndromes, this is a pretty common issue. We have three or four different programs that we use within the office. Um, you're free to go look at my website. I'll give you that reference in a minute. One's called Challenge and Choice. What's the challenge in your life that's uh, haunting you? What is it that you're always um, trying to deal with? And what choices can you make so as to avoid suffrage and maybe live with love or power instead of suffrage? We do a program called Brain Highways, which is a cognitive thinking program combined with an exercise program that literally grows new highways in the brain stem where your autonomic nervous system in your brain is housed and where your fight or flight system is housed. So we tampen down tone, anxiety, and tension. Systema Health is a program that we use. Uh, 
I, uh, as hard as it might believe, a uh, strong avocation is I'm actually an instructor for martial arts, and the martial art is Russian martial arts called Sistema. And there's parts of that, the entire martial art is based on reducing tension in all aspects of your life. And guess what? There's lots of applications for that in everybody's life. So we pull from the strengths of that for those that we can or for those that need it. We have Louise has been here in our part of our office for decades now, part of our support group and patient supports. You know, and our watchword of our support group is that I have RSD, but it does not have me. And if you have RSD and it has you, that is not a good thing. We need to make it so that you have it instead of the other way around. That's the first biggest, biggest thing you can possibly do for healing. So in summary, there are choices. Um, we want to objectively measure the presence of disease. We want to think about the underlying generator of pain. We want to determine an individualized course of care. We want to reduce co total load and focus on restoring pathology. This is a, a book that I uh, have written. Um, it's available online for those that you would like to get uh, more or read more. I also would like you to feel free to use our website, pmr.com. It's about 900 pages deep. Um, for those of you that want to uh, do the Challenge and Choice program, it's about 90 of the pages. Click on the Education tab and you'll see it there. And I also wanted to just tell you that some of the other things that we're doing on an ongoing basis. I'm chairman of the board of something called the American Academy of Thermology. This is a medical organization that's trying to educate and train physicians about dysautonomia, sympathetic pain, sympathetic dysfunction. There's other things that we do, other guidelines that we have. But we have written internationally peer-reviewed guidelines for medical thermal imaging. I've been blessed that I've been able to speak. Uh, last year I spoke at the University of Seoul in Korea um, in Sao Paulo Medical School. These, um, next year I've been invited to Japan. People are listening more and more. Um, I uh, went to Geisinger Medical Center this year. Um, they're now creating a new residency program and will be implementing thermal imaging as part of their uh, program and with an emphasis on dysautonomia. I'm writing a book um, for the physical medicine rehab specialty on a chapter on dysautonomia that's going to cover these things. People are starting to listen. Yesterday I was at the, uh, uh, the South Carolina Society of Pain Physicians. I could not believe my ears. It's like pitter patter, pitter patter. They're actually talking about different things, things that they didn't used to talk before. They're talking more and more like this. So I feel the field is trying to move our way. There are restrictions on, on things and medicine moves slowly, but I think we're trying to educate physicians, not just patients. Um, you're all welcome to also log on to aathermology.org. Um, this is where um, you'll find our annual session. Um, if you want to uh, invite one of your physicians to attend, just have them call me. If uh, the, somebody calls from this support group or from this um, meeting, says, um, my patient asked me to come. I heard this, I'll give them a discount on their rate just to get them there. Um, but it's being held in Greenville on October 13th. We will have people flying in from around the country to do nothing but talk about autonomic dysfunction, dysautonomias, and other applications for thermal imaging. And again, we publish internationally peer-reviewed guidelines so that um, this is done all according to medical standards and guidelines and federation um, criteria as to how people are supposed to peer-review and use medical procedures. Thank you very much.